So in order to understand photography, I think it's really important to take a look at the history because I think it's, uh, it's really interesting and it also gives you some perspective on why photography developed the way that it did. Now doing the research for this lesson, I realized it actually went back a little further than I had remembered. The first idea for a pinhole camera was kind of came up, came up with in the time of Plato. So in ancient Greece and in China around the same time, people were kind of imagining doing sort of sort of thought experiments th for something that would someday resemble what we'd use hundreds of years later, thousand years later, in the pinhole camera. Now the next step is the camera obscura. And the camera obscura is actually really interesting because it's basically a camera without film. The idea is you've got a wall, so you've got this empty room, and if you put a little tiny hole in the wall, the light will come in from the other side and it will be sort of focus through that hole and then onto the wall on the opposite side. So you can see here that this scene is being reflected on this wall or sort of focused on this wall through this hole. And this is basically the foundation of photography right here. This is the moment when this came into focus or well really quite literally as well. The only thing that was really missing was the chemicals for this. And these were discovered somewhere between the 1200, year 1200 and 1600. The different scientists at different times realized that, realized that there was this sort of group of chemicals that were related to silver, and one was silver nitrate. And this turned out, in the end, to be uh, photosensitive. And this whole discovery of it being photosensitive was first sort of formulated and organized by a guy named Wilhelm Homburg in 18 or er, sorry in 1694. And this is when he realized that there was a as he put it a photochemical effect. Now the groundwork was basically laid for photography to begin. So from here from 17 eight, 1700 through the 1800s um, you see kind of a focus on lenses and on sort of bettering this camera obscura over here. So you'd have people putting in a lens right here instead of just a hole. And this would lead directly to the developments that would come in the 1800s. And that development came f roaring around the corner in 1826 in southern France. This guy right here, his name is Joseph and his last name is Niepce, oh, and I'm spelling it wrong. And Joseph Niepce was just kind of a guy who was interested in the entire idea of photography, and he wanted to develop some kind of camera. And he had taken a camera obscura, and he had worked around with these light-sensitive silver nitrates, and at the same time he had been exchanging letters with this guy over here, Louis Dugard. Well, Char uh, Joseph Neves was the first person to really come up with a photo, a permanent photo, and that's a really important distinction because a lot of people had made photos, but it was this was the first permanent, and I'm not spelling it right, permanent photograph. Lots of times they would make them and then they would soon deteriorate really quickly, but this was the first one that would last, and it lasted up until now. You can see here that you've got some buildings, got maybe a field back here, and if you look really closely, you can actually see that the sun moved so far during the day that it's actually exposed the walls on both sides, so the lighting of the photo is actually a little off. Now this was done on a piece of pewter with some, just with some silver nitrate slapped on it, and it took eight hours to make this photograph. So eight, can you just imagine taking a photo that takes eight hours to make? You can't move the camera a single bit, except to leave the camera there for eight hours. So this step now behind them, the move then became to simplify and, and strengthen the power of photography and to make phot photograph something that you could take instantaneously, things that, so it wouldn't take eight hours to make a photograph. So when Niepce died, so Niepce died, Niepce, I'll say, died in 1833. And he passes all of his papers on to de Guerre, who in turn, just six years later, comes out with the daguerreotype. And this was a revolution. This was, this was very, very big news because 
the daguerreotype took the same process and basically made it something that could be done more quickly and more permanently. So instead of taking eight hours, it would just take a few minutes to make a photograph. And this is one of the first daguerreotypes. It's of a city, obviously, somewhere in southern France. And you can see here this guy with his foot up on a sort of pedestal. And this guy's actually getting his shoes shined. And there are lots of other people walking around on these streets, but this guy was the only person to stay still for the whole photograph, the whole time it was being made. And so he's the ol he's the first photographed human in well that we know of at least. So very interesting, you know. Um, so this whole discovery and the release of this discovery really prompted a lot of activity. Now this guy over here, his name is Fox Talbot. Fox Talbot was a British guy, so across the channel, and he had been interested in the idea of photography, or it wasn't called photography yet, but and the idea of capturing images on on silver nitrate plates, as they would say back then. And um, he, in this astronomer whose name was George, uh, sorry, John Herschel, uh, worked together on lots of different things. And in 1839, sort of through their collaboration, John Herschel came out with the glass negative. The glass negative was important because it was a better way of capturing the image and it was something that would become sort of a standard for some time for almost really 60 years or something like that so the glass negative is developed get the name down John Herschel quite a famous astronomer in his own right as well as a developer of photography and then just one year later Talbot comes out with his own process and it was called the calotype it was a wet process that had some sort of paper negative. And the thing was, though, that Talbot then, and this was Talbot, we'll make sure we distinguish that. And the thing was that Talbot put a copyright on this. And that is the reason that really the daguerreotype took off, because the daguerreotype was bought by the French government and put immediately in the public domain. That meant that any photographer could use it. And so the daguerreotype basically within a couple months became the standard form of photography for at that time. And the calotype, because it would have been a little bit more expensive and money would have been going to, him, to, to Fox Talbot over here, it never became quite the hit that the daguerreotype did. Now, things went very quickly from here, and within a couple months of the daguerreotype being developed, it was already being used in the field. And by the 1850s, it was really common to see roving photographers like this traveling through the countryside of, of Europe and, and even in America and other places and um, doing these sort of mobile photo studios. And because the whole, I mean, these days you can do everything that they could do in this with a laptop and a camera and even a cell phone. But at the time, it took quite a lot. You had a lot of chemicals, you had to do a lot of mixing, you needed a dark room, so everything had to be brought with you in the wagon. But it was very quick. You could see here that prominent people, this is the the Tsar and his wife, and this is um, this is Abe, Abe Lincoln, one of the early American presidents, all being photographed early on because they realized the power and, and were all very fascinated by the idea of photography.